Welcome to Rebuilding the Republic, conversations about America's future here at the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director. We can't talk meaningfully about the future without talking about the past. The past is where the future is invented. And that's the big revelation of Jill Lepore's new book, If Then, How the Simulmatix Corporation Invented the Future. We're thrilled to be here with her today. She's one of America's great historians. She's unequaled in her ability to find and explain forgotten episodes of America's past that shine a bright light on its present. You can find out more about her and her many best-selling books here on this page. The new book, If Then, is the story of the birth of data analytics in the 1950s and 60s, but it's as entertaining as a bank heist movie like John Huston's The Asphalt Jungle or Stanley Kubrick's The Killing. It's populated by a similar cast of brilliant and bumbling experts. Most importantly, it's a work of history that explains how we got to where we are now. This age of clickbait and filter bubbles of mass distraction and weaponized disinformation. This age of Cambridge Analytica, QAnon, and a new social network soon to be launched by Donald Trump. You can purchase If Then, How the Simulmatics Corporation Invented the Future from an independent bookstore via a link on this screen. Jill Lepore spoke to a packed crowd at Page Hall in 2005 when she visited with her book, New York Burning, the story of a little known slave revolt in colonial Manhattan in 1741, a book that went on to become a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Jill, it's great to see you again. Hey, nice to see you. Before we get to the book, uh, most universities are, are facing significant cuts in the midst of this pandemic. Our, our neighbors at the University of Vermont are cutting 27 programs, almost all of them in the humanities. Um, for any cost conscious state or university officials who may be tuning in, can you present a spirited defense of preserving the humanities? <laughs> On cue. Um, you know, one way I might think about it is, um, it's, it's, it's not unlike uh, calculating in the environmental costs of fossil fuel use. Um, that is to say, we need to set aside the metrics that we might ordinarily use in order to assess value because they hide so many kinds of costs. I think the costs of, of, of not passing on the study of the humanities to future generations are huge, but they are, are, they're, they're harder to see and in a way, they're harder to quantify because the humanities is not a, a quantifiable science. And I, I think it's a bit—it's a bit of a tragedy of, uh, you know, not simply of capitalism. I think specifically of a neoliberal approach to the university that we ask the humanities to justify themselves in terms that are external to humanistic inquiry. And history specifically, why do we need history? Um, you know, I think actually there is no just sort of free floating need for history and any more than there's a free floating need for anything else. I actually think the burden to justify the study of history falls on the faculty and the courses that they teach and the students that they draw. I think it, there is a lot sort of swims in the culture, but I think that case needs to be made by each of us in the classroom every time we gather, we gather together. Uh, I I do think that we maybe within a higher education have allowed history to be defined by people who aren't historians such that we conflate when we say history I think a lot of people um, what they mean by that is a, something that I would think of more as heritage tourism or some weird non empirical investigation of the relationship between the past and the present, but that it is that is something you know that exists in the world of popular culture or, or public commemoration. Uh, history is a humanistic inquiry that involves thinking about how change happens. So is biology. You know, we we, we don't question that we should understand 
and appreciate biological systems in order to think about how change happens. Uh, history, history is a method that, that allows us to do that, uh, that is specifically concerned with the world of humankind and not necessarily exclusively with the natural world. And I don't, I think one's appreciation for the biological sciences is pretty limited without having the, the, the context of a historian's appreciation for how change happens. Uh, I think one's study of the law can't really proceed without having an appreciation for the methods uh, and evidentiary standards and historical writing. So I think that you know we we ought to understand many different disciplines is engaged in the big question of why things change and how things change and why things sometimes stay the same. But in the sense of uh, you know to use the baseball analogy because I've been watching a lot of Red Sox playing spring training you know, history is kind of the utility player of higher education. All disciplines have a history. Um, all questions that we might ask, all problems that we try to solve have histories. So if you don't have a proper method for investigating the past of a problem, then you don't have a very good method to approach, approach a solution to it. So you've, you've been talking about it in, in, your, in your previous answer, but uh, in, in the book, you point out that we've had a a prediction industry since the dawn of civilization with prophets and oracles. Um, so is history itself a kind of oracle and is it the best oracle that we have? No, I don't think history is an oracle. Uh, I, I appreciate the premise of the question, but certainly in the way that we uh, practice this history as a discipline in the modern university, um, it, is, it, it rejects that notion that the past determines the future, which is what I, I would take it an oracle would fundamentally do. An oracle has the ability to read the past in order to predict the future. I, I, I think that we, one of the things that I appreciate in the study of the humanities is um, the, the very uncomfortable capitulation to uncertainty. Um, I, I think it, it demands a lot of us to accept uncertainty and there's much that is noble and courageous in the history of humanity that involves that refusal, but I think there's great wisdom in accepting it. So, you know, I think about the last year and how for me every day, and I, you know, for many people every day begins with, you know, opening up some media app on your phone and looking at a chart of the number of coronavirus cases and deaths or the vaccination rates or you know some really important and essential to how you frame your day quantification about um, public health. And one of the reasons that we check that is so we can decide how to act, but also because we're we're hoping for there to be a prediction offered. I mean, every day we want to know when will we be vaccinated? When will when will the mask mandate be lifted where we live. Um, and, and those as matters of how we live from day to day are really crucial. Like we all stand incredibly indebted to the science um, and the, you know, I think also kind of the art and science of the public health prediction industry that's going on. But I, but I also think there's a piece, a deeper piece of, well, you know, I'm gonna get the vaccine when I'm gonna get the vaccine. Like I can't actually know that. I won't know that today. I might not know that tomorrow. Um, that there's a part of the study of history and it's um, led many lessons about contingency and uncertainty that is a, a real gift to getting by. You talk about the sense among the, the vanguard of Silicon Valley that they've created something entirely brand new, born out of nothing. Um, and you show that just isn't true. Um, why are they ignorant of their own history and why are we ignorant of it? Well, look, I mean, let me just say uh, some terrific, excellent, energetic, fascinating, intrepid people work in Silicon Valley doing good work and meaningful work and you know, caring about its consequences and collaborating with other people. And you know, I don't mean to just say, I, I think I am often guilty of, uh, and I think it's kind of an easy mark you know, to say Silicon Valley, they're, they're a lot of the crazy people. 
Um, but I do think there is a culture and an ethos to the place that quite specifically disavows the importance of the past. And that is partly because the gospel of Silicon Valley is, is, is uh, the concept of disruptive innovation uh, about which I've written about extensively, which, for, you know, which was devised in the 1990s as a kind of um, recycling of the idea of progress, but absent all the critiques of the idea of progress that came about in the aftermath of you know, Hiroshima and the Second World War, um, the, the, the embrace of, of technological change as constitutive of, of human progress really suffered given that the astonishing losses um, to all of us that were represented by uh, the, the catastrophic change to our climate through technological change. Um, so what disruptive innovation did uh, was say, oh, don't you don't have to feel bad about embracing technological progress because it doesn't This is, we need to disrupt the existing state of affairs, and this will lead to um, maximal business success. And so we need, it will also lead to tremendous failure, uh, unprecedented rates of failures of new companies, but this too will be part of the process of disruptive innovation. We must constantly be, you know, reinventing ourselves. And as long as we never look back, there will never be any stock to take about what we've done. Um, so, you know, with disruptive innovation, you want to start a ride sharing service, you know, your Uber or Lyft before Uber or Lyft exist. And the one thing you absolutely cannot do is study public transportation, the history of, uh, you know, taxi services, the history of other ride services. Like you were actually not supposed to do that because it would impede your ability to completely disrupt and reinvent and innovate in the ride sharing space, you know, as people would say. So, what that means, though, then, is you do things like create an Uber or a Lyft, and you do disrupt the industry, and people lose jobs, and you know that happens. You also create new jobs, and the new jobs aren't as good, but you also create traffic problems, and you know there are all these kind of knock-on effects that you don't think about because you're relieved of the obligation to think about the the past or to study uh, dynamics from previous generations that might suggest to you what the consequences of your actions might be because that would impede um, the swiftness of your you know, rise to greatest profit. And um, so then you're left with, if you kind of commit to the past is irrelevant, the past is a shackle, then anything you do does actually appear to you to be strikingly novel. <laughs> so, so I think there's, you know, there's this kind of, it, that too is sort of a knock-on effect. Like, I don't think it's too like, I think they they really do genuinely think that they have invented everything from scratch because it's part of the culture to not look at where anything has come from. So in, in your book, uh, we, we couldn't ask for a more intriguing bunch of characters. Uh, the founder of Simulmatics is a charming liar and huckster. The chief mathematician is clinically insane. How important are characters to writing an engaging history book? Um, so when I was being trained as a historian, I was told that they basically didn't exist. Like you were never supposed to write about a character. And if you read a scholarly journal article, there are names of people, but they're very infrequently characters. There's sometimes a little like a mini, uh, almost like back of the baseball card sketch, you know, like you might find out the birth and death dates of someone or you know, some one striking feature, like I had six fingers, <laughs> but, but you don't actually like, it's just not part of the way that the way we train people in the discipline, um, that there, that there should be characters. Um, that has always been, um, a, an objection that I have had to, um, not that everybody should write character-based historical accounts because everybody shouldn't, but that it should be a, a, like, you should, it should count among the possible tools you could pull out of the box when you're when you're when you're building your history and for me um I in the way that I write which is to make an argument by telling a story characters are usually pretty essential to that it can be done without characters if there's um character like elements um in the story 
but like if it's really event driven and the event can be very um, kind of majestically rendered. Um, but I really need characters. And, and for this project, which is about this data science company that was founded in 1959, I wouldn't have done it if there wasn't at least the one strong female character who's uh, Minnow McPhee, who's really extraordinary cache of letters that her family shared with me puts the company, you know, you can get outside the company and look at it from someone else's vantage. Uh, that was really impor important to me. I, I think the project would have been undoable without without those letters, really. Right, and um, is Minnow McPhee uh, a favorite character? Do you have a favorite character, if it's fair to ask? Um, yeah, I, I, I like her and I like her sister-in-law who she often appears in this letter, this woman, Jane Emery, um, who really kind of, she offers some very biting critiques of these, these guys and I enjoy that. And she's funny. Um, there, are, there are a lot of characters that I liked. Um, and I actually, the guys who are the scientists for the company, uh, I found really fascinating and not, not villainous. I mean, I think they had their they had their real limitations, and their biggest problem was they didn't understand they had limitations. They were so propped up by the culture. Oh, men of science, you know, oh, you are at MIT, you must be brilliant, and you should tell us how to live <laughs> like that. That, and I and I I feel I feel for you know these young guys who work at like a Palantir. They, the whole culture is like, thank you, tell us how to live you know, thank God you know how to write code so well. I, like, it's a weird thing to do to young people, to a generation, to say it's your objective to, to, to re-engineer society. And we, we're glad to have you do it. Like the technocracy piece of that is a weird burden to ask young people to carry around. So, I mean, the other person I really love um, a lot, it was just super fun to write about, uh, was this guy, Eugene Burdick, who's a political theorist at UC uh, Berkeley, Partly because he was just incredibly fun to write about, but um, but I also admired in him that even though he was very much that golden boy, um, you know, please, Professor Burdick, tell us how to live. <laughs> um, he he was a huge critic of that, and he was able to see why it was going to create problems down the road, um, or to at least worry about it in a way that not not enough people worried about it. At one point, you compare the characters in the story to the oddball collection of experts that you'd find in a, in a bank heist movie. And that's just such a, a delightful way of, of framing this. Um, what, what attracted you to that analogy? To how, how did you come to think of it? Oh, you know, part, I had first written the book with um, Eugene Burdick as the first chapter, because kind of chronologically, he, the book is pretty strictly chronological and he kind of is the beginning. Um, and then I went back to the guy who was the kind of Danny Ocean of the Ocean's Eleven, which is this guy, Ed Greenfield, who's the, the president of the company and the founder of the company. And my editor said, no, you're writing like a heist. You're writing, you are writing the genre of like a heist movie. You need to start with the guy who's putting together the gang. And I was like, oh, that's true. <laughs> That's just true. Like, I, I don't know why I didn't see that. And I reordered the chapters and then sort of, then the things sort of fell into place a little bit more narratively because then the plot really is of the first, I even forget, I think the book has four parts and the first part is just the getting together the gang. Like, who do you need, who do you need to, to fart, start the company? Um, yeah, so that was actually helpful to me, but that wasn't, I, it wasn't even my idea. So, so getting getting back to uh, Eugene Burdick, um, you, you talk a bit about his, or quite a bit about his dystopian fiction. Um, how important is dystopian literature? And I'm asking this on behalf of a literary arts organization. Um, is it as important as climate forecasts and economic forecasts? Mm -hmm. You know, I wrote an article about dystopian literature for the New Yorker a few years ago. It was called, No, We Can't. <laughs> it was kind of at the end of the Obama years, the yes, the yes, we can. And it was sort of about the taste for radical pessimism um, because I think there's been a real juvenilization of dystopian literature, partly because of the YA world and 
the fashion for dystopian literature, the kind of Hunger Games moment. Um, and I, I think dystopianism is, is an interesting historical phenomenon, but I, I also think it can be a very cheap way to avoid thinking carefully about a problem. Um, so, you know, Burdick was doing this at a moment when, um, I, I guess, and I don't, know, I don't have a pat answer to your question, but now I'm thinking about it and I think, well, I think you could make the claim that the dystopian warnings of the 1960s all failed, right? Like if you've seen 2001, well, Hal is driving the ship. Like we're, we're on that ship and Hal's still the computer running it. Like we didn't, that didn't dismantle it. You know, I mean, I guess closer would be a kind of Dr. Strange love. Like we sort of, we did survive the atomic era and maybe, um, and, and maybe that was important. I heard a great interview last week, must've been on the New Yorker radio hour with Evan Osnos, who was interviewing these two guys who'd written a book, I think it's called 2034. That's a dystopian vision about a cyber war with China in the year 2034. And uh, they're both military guys. And one guy, I think he was an army general, credited um, for dystopian science fiction with averting global nuclear apocalypse. He said it was really important. It was a really important to policymakers and to the military that it was constantly being thrown in our face visions of what would happen if we ever launched these missiles. And you needed to be able to imagine the consequences in order to never press the button. And that he thought we hadn't done that yet for cyber war. And that that's why they wrote this dystopian work of fiction was they wanted to begin to build out that imaginary through the world of the novel um, because without it, we really risk continuing to escalate um, conflict with China and to develop cyber weapons um, without public debate. Uh, so I thought that actually was a very good case for a certain kind of political thriller. Um, but, and I and maybe you could make the case that with, with Cold War mutual assured destruction, it was effective or contributed um, to arms limitation talks and eventually to the end of the Cold War. But I don't think you can make that case with artificial intelligence. There were plenty of dystopian warnings about it. You know, we look at Asimov from the 1950s, like we have had plenty of dystopian warnings about all that. That's why that stuff is so much in, you know, in public discourse now, because nobody, it didn't, didn't, it didn't, it didn't work to stop this stuff. And I think one reason is that it's actually like most films that purport to be somehow like a expose, like social network or something, they're actually completely bound up in the idolatry of it all, of just the worship of these, this, this notion that we have a particular kind of computer genius, um, that you have to get outside that far-fetched idea in order to, for the dystopianism to really work. If, if, what, if one of the things it's trying to do is as avert disaster, as opposed to just sensationalize the possibility of it. So one of your uh, characters, one of your main characters, Ithiel de Sola Pool, far farsighted behavioral scientist, um, predicts the rise of customized news feeds that will allow people to see only what they wish to see. Um, can you talk about that? And are, are, aren't we correct in customizing our, our news feeds? Um, what, why, why would we want to step out outside our, our filter bubble in, into the world of you know, QAnon or, or whatever? Um, I, I found Poole to be truly fascinating. So he was the research director of the company. And when the company went bankrupt, he sort of had already begun to reinvent himself as a kind of prophet of the digital era. Um, because he had a hand in building that world in so many different ways, including through predictive analytics and simulatics, but through a number of other kinds of research and applications that he was involved in, especially with early ARPANET. Um, and he, uh, he had had a political conversion over the course of the 1960s. Um, he had been a, a kind of staunch liberal in the 50s and 60s, an anti-communist, you know, real cold warrior. Um, but with you know, the events of 1968, he, he had a political conversion and, and became a neoconservative. 
later became a you know big favorite Nixon uh, campaign for Nixon, and then went on to become a neoconservative. So he became something of a libertarian in his views about technology, which had huge consequences. But because he was such a prophet of, especially of the internet, um, also pioneer in the field of social networking, which is a phrase he coined, um, that when he argued that this new um, form of communication ought to be completely free of all government regulation because he'd become a libertarian, that argument carried huge force and is a real influence in the shaping of the internet that we have now. Um, one of the, so he, on the one hand, made very strong arguments of advocacy about a deregulated, in, you know, about um, a kind of libertarian cyberspace, which is what we have. We have a libertarian cyberspace. Um, but on the other hand, uh, uh, that meant that a lot of questions where you might think about what the consequences might be of something and whether a regulatory scheme might be necessary, he refused to call for a regulatory scheme and suggested that this was something that would have to be assessed down the road. So in this essay that he wrote in 1968, when he predicts the personal newspaper, um, he says, well, this is, this would, it would, I, I, when I think about that as a political scientist, it becomes clear to me that it probably won't be possible for the party system to endure because a, 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 for a party to exist, a large enough people, a group of people have to have a sense of their shared political interests. But if you're all getting individual personalized news, we would only have a sense of our individual political interests. And so I don't think the, you know, they probably wouldn't really kind of really uh, rearrange political communities. And you can tell that he thinks that could be pretty bad, but he also so committed to his, you know, um, zero regulation cyberspace that he can't sort of say, I wonder if maybe we shouldn't do that, you know? Um, so I, I don't know, I, I think he casts a very long shadow uh, as a very, very thoughtful person whose political commitments sort of interfered with his ability um, to, 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 to call for a bit more caution. You quote a, a Facebook engineer who's a uh, famous quote, uh, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads, that sucks. Talking to young people who may be watching this, um, what would you advise them to be doing instead? Um, I ask most people that I think are, uh, that ask me what they should be thinking about. I don't offer my advice freely to people that haven't signed up, but you've asked me. Um, have you thought about K to 12 public education? That's what I mainly ask people. because I think it's the most important work that you could probably do. Um, and I think there's been a real falling off of um, our shared commitment as a society to the education of our children. And I really think it's a failure of higher education, especially uh, more elite institutions of higher education to communicate the importance of that as a, as, as a choice. Um, it, is a, it is a truly essential profession. Uh, it is one that can draw people of any kinds of, any range of talents. Um, and I, I, I guess I, I put that out first. No, that was, fine to go work in market research. Like people work in market research all the time. Like that's what the getting people to click on your ads is. But I actually think it's also important if you're gonna go work in market research, I, I, I don't, I don't, I think it would be useful to you to have a sense of proportion about it that, you know, um, the the veneration of the, 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 the the companies in Silicon Valley that are basically just trying to get people to buy things more efficiently, um, as if this is uh, the most searingly important research that's being done in the world today, is 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 odd to me. Like it's fine to go do that work, but um, I think don't don't buy into the idea that the salary you'd be paid for that is a, is a measure of its importance to the world. So in an age of, of questionable information, we've been asking our guests to recommend high quality sources of information, but what about information about the future? Are there futurists or forecasts that you are willing to recommend to us? Um, 
You know, that is a, a, a really interesting question. I don't, um, it's, it, it's, it's a failure of mine that I can think of realms of prediction that I think are, are pretty worthless rather than uh, elements that are, um, that I turn to. I guess I also object somewhat to the implied passivity of looking at predictions. Um, I wrote an article last year where I came across an essay for this article of an Italian philosopher who said, you know, it really bothered him when people asked him, what do you think is gonna, what's the future of democracy? It was the question of the hour in the 1930s, the way it is today. What is the future of democracy? People will always ask. And he, he, his answer was my favorite because he just said, it's not like the weather. It's not, it's not like, I'm not a meteorologist to tell you like, oh, it's gonna rain tomorrow. The future of democracy, like that's up to you. Like, I, I'm, you don't have to ask me, should you carry an umbrella to work tomorrow? You should go out tomorrow and stop the rain. That's what I like about uh, ask questions about the future. It's up to you, go out and stop the rain. Don't ask somebody else whether you need an umbrella. So last question, um, Simulmatic sought to investigate and influence possible futures. We're always on the threshold of possible futures. What's the best possible future in your view that we can hope for? Um, geez, I don't know. That's not a, that's not really an answerable question. I think, um, we need to, this is a kind of day by day moment in the history of humanity. Uh, I think we need to step with purpose into uh, the rebuilding of the world that has been devastated by this pandemic and by uh, the extraordinary excesses of unregulated capitalism and uh, environmental degradation and racial injustice. And we, um, I think we need every moment to be looking ahead to thinking about what each of us can do, um, not individually, entirely, for sure, um, but collectively to think about how to address each of these problems and uh, where to put your foot down, uh, not just to follow someone else's footsteps. The book is If Then, How the Simulmatics Corporation Invented the Future. It's available for purchase from an indie bookstore via a link on this screen. Thanks so much, Jill Laporte.